and uh, I have a couple of questions. I'm sure that all of those questions you have already answered to many other journalists on many other media. <laughs> but maybe I will try to be a little bit different. <laughs> okay. Uh, I interview your father. No. Yeah, uh, last, year, last year in November wow. in in Kirkenes in Norway. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. been there for a co one co conference and we met there. The Barents uh, yeah. Corporation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Barents Corporation. So, so it was an interesting opportunity for me. And uh, so, your father told me in November 2014 that uh, there is uh, the possibility of military conflict between NATO and Russia is out of question. Is it still? Is it, would you say this is the same assessment NATO NATO has? You have? Also we don't see any uh, media threat against any NATO uh, uh, allied uh, uh, country, and uh, one reason for that is, of course, that uh, NATO provides uh, credible deterrence. Uh, the whole reason why we have NATO is that uh, any country. Uh, uh, any potential adversary of uh, any NATO country uh, should know that an attack on one NATO country will be an attack on all NATO uh, countries. Yeah. And, uh, and as long as this uh, deterrence is credible, as it is today, mm -hmm. then of course the chance for any, the possibility of any uh, armed attack on any NATO countries is, uh, is very small. Mm -hmm. So Russia is not an immediate threat, but is Russia a threat? I think it is uh, too, 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 the world is too complicated mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and too uh, uh, complex mm -hmm. uh, to try to divide uh, the world into uh, uh, either friends or adversaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what we see is a changing uh, security environment uh, where we see a more assertive Russia Russia, which has been responsible for violating international law, illegally annexing uh, Crimea uh, and uh, uh, continuing to destabilize eastern uh, Ukraine. Uh, um, and, uh, and therefore NATO has to adapt, and we are adapting uh, by uh, increasing our in investing our collective defense, increasing the readiness, the preparedness of our forces, uh, increasing also the presence in the eastern part of the alliance with air policing, mm -hmm. more, uh, uh, more, more exercises on the ground, uh, and um, and uh, uh, at the same time, we continue to strive for a more cooperative and constructive relationship with Russia. And I believe there is no contradiction between strong defence mm -hmm. and political dialogue. Actually, mm -hmm. I believe that strong defence defence. Uh, provides the grounds for also political engagement with Russia. And at this Russia. moment, do we have any dialogue with, with Russia? Yes, we have. Uh, we have a political dialogue uh, in many different formats. Uh, we have a political dialogue uh, in NATO uh, with uh, Russian diplomats. Uh, uh, I meet with, uh, uh, so I, I've met uh, several times with. Uh, with uh, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, mm -hmm. and uh, we decided uh, last uh, uh, spring to suspend practical cooperation with Russia, but to maintain the channels for political dialogue open. In addition to that, many NATO allies um, on bilateral basis are, uh, also have different kinds of political dialogue with Russia. In the Normandy format, uh, France, Germany uh, discuss with Russia, yeah. of course, the future of uh, how we can find a peaceful solution to the conflict in Ukraine. Um, Russia was uh, part of the process that led to the uh, nuclear deal on Iran. Uh, Russia uh, are engaged or is engaged uh, in, the, in, in, in the efforts to find a political solution uh, to the uh, crisis in uh, Syria. They mm -hmm. also have dialogue with the United States and other yeah. other other uh, uh, NATO allies. So there are different channels, different formats. Uh, uh, so there is a political engagement with, mm -hmm. with Russia. My message is that as long as we are firm, as long as we are strong, as long as we are predictable, then uh, we have the basis for engaging. Mm -hmm. uh, but Russia is sometimes, oh, not sometimes, all the time saying that what NATO is doing, for example, exercise is uh, uh, more visible presence on eastern flank is aims 
aimed against Russia. Now we also have a, in some countries there is a debate that, that, that there should be a permanent presence of NATO troops in countries like Poland, Baltic countries. Uh, so to divide those questions, how do you see what Russia is saying uh, regarding NATO, what NATO is doing? And, uh, and the second question is basically, what do you think about the permanent presence of, of NATO troops on eastern flank? Uh, everything NATO does is defensive, we, uh, it's proportioned and it's uh, completely in line with our international uh, uh, commitments. Uh, what we have seen is that Russia has used military force to change borders in Europe. Uh, Russia has military forces in Georgia, uh, controlling 20% of uh, Georgian territory. Uh, they, are, they have forces inside Georgia uh, uh, and violating the international recognized borders of Georgia. They have uh, forces in Moldova and Transnistria yeah. and they also now have uh, used force to annex uh, Crimea. And of course this is part of a pattern uh, which uh, gives uh, reason for great concern and which requires a response from NATO. And we are responding by increasing the, the readiness, the, the, the preparedness of our forces, so we are able to provide an absolute security guarantee to all allies uh, uh, and making sure that we are able to defend all allies against any threats also in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we are doing and that's the way we are responding to the Russian behavior. I can't remember the second question. <laughs> yeah, the, the permanent presence, that some countries are asking for it. We have already increased our presence in the eastern part of the alliance. Right. Uh, we have more exercises, more boots on the ground on, on a rotational basis. So, so I met with the uh, with, uh, Dragoon Ride or yeah. as a US Dragoon or, Crossing. Uh, uh, ride, yeah. And they will be in Slovakia yeah. today or tomorrow or soon. Yeah, very soon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we have more exercises, we have more, more, more military presence. Uh, uh, so doing exercises, uh -huh. uh, we have more air policing, uh, AVACs, fighter jets, uh, we, have, uh, we have more ships uh, in the Baltic Sea, the Black Sea, as part of the assurance measures, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and now we just uh, activated or inaugurated the uh, NFIU, so yeah. the, the small headquarters yeah. uh, in six uh, eastern allied countries. So we have already uh, increased our presence, mm -hmm. and in addition, there will be pre-positioning of equipment, and there will be, uh, and, uh, and we are increasing the readiness of our forces, meaning that we can reinforce faster if needed. Mm -hmm. So all of this um, is, uh, is uh, underpinning uh, mm -hmm. the credibility of uh, uh, NATO's uh, uh, deterrence. Mm -hmm. But permanent presence, are you in favor of it or not? Simply. <laughs> As I said, we have already increased uh, presence, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, that uh, contributes to the important uh, task of deterrence, which is mm -hmm. one of NATO's main tasks. Uh, and the idea is that as long as we maintain a credible deterrence, there will be no adversary that will attack any NATO ally mm -hmm. because they know that there will be attack on the whole alliance. Yeah, uh, when, I, uh, when I made my preparation for this interview, <laughs> I asked Twitter any questions for Secretary General Stoltenberg. And basically, any, uh, almost every question was about uh, uh, threat from the, from the south, mm. which is a little bit different when would I probably ask this question a year ago. Probably it would be more about East. So how NATO is uh, seeing the situation right now. We have we have situation on the east, and we have definitely a situation on the on the on the on the south. Uh, so, how the preparation, what we are may, maybe doing on the east, somehow, uh, do they have any impact on what we are doing on the south? Um, not not directly, but. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, 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 and we speak about very different uh, kinds of challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, to the east we have a state actor, Russia, uh, which has violated international law and used force to grab 
a part of another country. This is the first time since the end of the Second World War that this has happened in Europe. And, uh, and I think that a basic principle, a fundamental principle for cooperation is respect. And respect, if you want to cooperate with your neighbor, you have to respect the border of, of your neighbor. And that's, that's the problem. My experience as a Norwegian politician is that we have been able to work with Russia, right. to cooperate with Russia, not least because Russia has always respected our, our borders. Uh, and that creates the foundation for and the trust which is needed to uh -huh. have cooperation. This has been the case in Norway, Russia. This is not the case, for instance, uh, Russia, uh, Ukraine. Uh, uh, but, but at least this is, this is a state actor uh, uh, which is going to be there. It's our biggest neighbor. And I will continue to strive for a more cooperative and constructive relationship with Russia. The challenge to the south is a completely different challenge, because that's a non-state actor. Mm -hmm. It's ISIL, it's terrorist organizations, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's turmoil and violence. And, uh, and our aim is to eradicate the Islamic State, mm -hmm. which is a barbaric uh, organization uh, responsible for barbaric violence and uh, atrocities. And, uh, and uh, so therefore, it's, it's, it's very, it's very, what should I say, uh, it, it's, it's a very completely different kind of challenge mm -hmm. and threat mm -hmm. we see to the south. But maybe there is a one connection between those threats, maybe remote, but still I, I see it, you might not agree. Both, though, Russia and ISIL, both they are very skillful in using propaganda. Uh, uh, ISIL, ISIL has some different aims, maybe, but Russia is also using propaganda. How is NATO right now ready to to face the fact that we are showing, we are we are facing the propaganda, we are facing hybrid warfare? Because NATO and NATO allies will never meet propaganda with propaganda. Mm -hmm. That will not work. Uh, uh, I'm certain that in the long run the truth will prevail, and uh, to just be part of open democratic debates in mm -hmm. open democratic societies is in the long run the best answer. And we have seen over the last year increased support for NATO in, among NATO allied uh, countries and, yeah. and voters mm -hmm. in, in, in NATO allied countries. And we have seen decreased support for Russia. So, uh, of course, the figures varies a bit between different countries, yeah. but the overall picture is that there is increased support for NATO. Uh, of course, there are challenges. There, there is a lot of uh, uh, propaganda, disinformation out there, and we have to be uh, on the alert to answer and to, and to counter this uh, propaganda. But the best way is not to counter with more propaganda. It's the best way is to continue to be in favor of open, transparent, democratic debates. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the long run, the truth will prevail. Talking about propaganda, uh, uh, Russia is what Russia is saying is also that that we, I mean the West, NATO, the U.S., we are to blame for what is going on on the South, Libya, Syria. And in fact, also our prime minister is saying the same, that we did something in Libya, we are doing something in Syria. I mean, the West, not saying NATO, but in Libya it was a NATO, NATO, NATO operation. That we, we are to blame for this mess we have right now. So do you agree with this uh, view that, especially in Libya, also NATO is to blame? And then should we correct something? And what could be a... Uh, so should we correct something? As I think everyone always should be open for uh, learning from experience. And uh, I have learned everything every day, or some, something every day, and I hope that I will continue to learn out of experience. And that's, of course, also the case for NATO. At the same time, I would like to underline that one of the most difficult uh, dilemmas uh, we always will face in international politics is when to use a military force and when to not use military force. Uh, and uh, I think we have seen situations where the international community was heavily criticized for not using military force. I remember 
the, uh, the genocide in Rwanda, and then the international community was criticized for not protecting the people in uh, Rwanda. Uh, then I remember the, uh, the, the massacre in Srebrenica, and again the international community was criticized for not protecting the people in Srebrenica. Then we used military force uh, in, the, in, in the Balkans, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, Serbia, and I think that was an important reason why we have been able to uh, create peace and stability in the former uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, in Libya, well, what NATO did was to follow up a clear UN mandate to protect civilians. So we did uh, what we were expected to do. The problem was that after we ended our military operation, which had a, which had a clear UN mandate, then there was too little follow-up uh, uh, when as related to uh, the need to stabilize the country. Uh, that's not only a NATO responsibility, that's a responsibility yeah, for the whole international community. Yeah. Uh, um, in Syria, we didn't intervene. There, has, there hasn't been any international troops or NATO troops in Syria, and Syria is really a disaster. So the idea that it's NATO that has caused the conflicts, it's completely wrong, especially when you see it, when, when you assess or look at uh, Syria. Uh -huh. uh, so what NATO does now is to work together with the government of Afghanistan, with the government of Iraq, uh, as I said, Jordan, Tunisia, other countries, we help them to stabilize their own countries. And I'm 100% certain that uh, in the long run, this is the only viable solution to create stability, peace in, in the Middle East, in North Africa, and all the way to uh, Afghanistan. So do you think that NATO will play any role in Syria conflict, I mean military? Uh, all NATO allies participate in the coalition. Uh, fighting ISIL, and many of uh, the NATO allies are also participating in the bombings, bomb, bombing strike, strikes against ISIL in in uh, also in uh, in, uh, in Syria and uh, and Iraq. Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, the important thing now is that uh, uh, we uh, try to do whatever we can to stabilize uh, the different countries in the re in in the region. Also. Iraq, Jordan, also many countries, uh, and uh, even if that will take time, I'm certain also that that's the best strategy to also have a long-term solution to the migrant crisis, uh, because we have to help these countries to stabilize to be able to reduce the number of migrants. And role for NATO for in the mig migrant crisis? The role for NATO is there, and we are uh, fulfilling, uh, uh, and we are we are playing our part. Uh, by uh, addressing the root causes of the migration crisis. Uh, because we have the operation in Afghanistan, we have thousands of soldiers there training, advising, assisting the Afghan national forces so they can succeed in stabilizing their own country. We are, we are very uh, we're closely work, we are cooperating with uh, Jordan, which is an island of stability, in the sea of instability in the Middle East. Because we believe that strong, as a stable Jordan is key for uh, uh, trying to create more stability in the Middle East, and we just agreed with uh, the government of Iraq to help them with defense capacity building, uh, and we work with countries in North Africa. So the whole idea is is, that, is to project stability uh -huh. uh, without always deploying large number of combat forces. Uh -huh. This will take time. It's not easy. There will be setbacks, but 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 as I said, there is no other alternative. Uh, to uh, uh, a long-term solution uh, than to continue to try to stabilize the countries where the migrants are coming from. Uh, and NATO is playing a key role there. I would like NATO to do even more. Uh, so we address the long-term challenge, the long-term uh, task of stabilizing the countries. The EU is facing the immediate problems in Europe. Mm -hmm. But you have probably heard from, uh, from uh, Czech uh, Vice Prime Minister, Mr. Babic, that NATO should secure EU borders. Is it a role for NATO? As I said, NATO is addressing the long-term causes uh, uh, for uh, uh, the migrant crisis, the instability, the, the, the turmoil, the, the, the fighting, which takes place 
in many countries uh, in the Middle East in, in North Africa and we are uh, working with several countries to try to uh, stabilize to create peace and stability in those countries. That's the long-term solution. And, how and then the short term yeah. <coughs> is about <coughs> border control, Schengen, migration policies, possible uh, mandatory quotas. This is something which is EU uh, responsibility. Uh, and I think that it will just make the the efforts even more difficult and the situation even more confusing if NATO started to intervene uh, in issues which are clearly EU responsibilities. Uh, I think that will only create more uh, confusion, uh, less uh, also uh, possibility for a comprehensive approach. So part of being part of an international community is also to understand the different responsibilities and the division of labor or responsibility, mm -hmm. responsibilities between different international organizations. That's the last question. Yeah, okay. Is the refugee crisis uh, maybe also somehow connected to, to rise of ISIL? Uh, what's, the, what's the assessment of NATO? Do you see it as a security problem uh, for Europe, maybe in a medium, long term? So my, um, my main focus now is the human tragedy, mm -hmm. uh, which we see evolves or take place in in Europe with the thousands of people uh, which who have lost their lives trying to get into Europe, uh, and this is a human tragedy which has a profound effect on us all. It's about people, it's about children, it's about men and women losing their lives. And, uh, and uh, I think uh, the pictures and uh, the stories have a great impact or a profound effect on all of us. Um, so that's my main concern. And then, of course, there is rather a wide range of challenges. We have to address them together. We have to work together, but also understand the different roles we have to play. NATO has an important role to play long-term solution, stabilizing the countries. Uh, EU, EU has a role to play, both to work to NATO, together with NATO in stabilizing those countries, but also to address the immediate uh, challenges uh, in Europe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. And fun. welcome to Bratislava, by the way. I, I think it's your first visit. Yeah, it's your yeah. first visit as a NATO. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very thank much. You. Yeah, thank you.